Where are all my friends? Eric Rojas. It's a long time coming. It is. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But I think the biggest one is that we've been friends for a pretty long time. I think we're going on, are we going on like five years now? Feels about right. Yeah. Feels, Let's go. Feels like, I feel like for as long as I've lived in California, I've, I've known you. And we yeah. kind of keep crossing paths. And The beauty of Los uh, Angeles. One of my favorite things about you is we have a couple really good mutual friends. Like yes. there's the mutual friends where they're super social and everyone knows yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But then there's like the low key mutual friends right. where if you're friends with them, I think Steph is the one that comes Absolutely. to my mind. It's like the certain mutuals where you're like, yo, like yeah, you yeah. just know. Major, major shout out to Steph Mersky. If yeah. you're watching, dude, I dude. hope you do. I mean, we love you dearly. We really do. It, um, we have to. We have to talk about. What's Steph crazy? For that. I was thinking about is it. We are going on almost two years since him and Lee's wedding in Big yeah, Bang. Yeah, because we. Yeah, we were all. We rode out in your car. Yeah, me, you, and Jordan. Yeah. all hopped in my car and took the like took the drive out to Big Bear after that was two years ago. I mean, next month. Yeah, because it was October of 2020, if I'm not mistaken. Oh my god! Correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's right. And what? ever it's so then it's been about two years where I'm like, yeah, we need to do a podcast. I think it was two years ago. We were like, let's do it next week. Yeah. <laughs> and here we are two years later. But I Holy think shit. everything happens for a reason because I feel like I can provide a lot more of like insight into what we were talking about before the mic started rolling about like yeah. just overall experience in the, for lack of a better word, creative field. Yeah. You know so I, mean? I think there's a couple things <clears throat> to cover as we get into your story. So what I was telling you right before we started recording is I like to have every podcast provide some amount of like utility, like where somebody absolutely like goes to listen and they learn something from it. And I think a lot of times I like to showcase different careers because as people grow in their careers, they've learned a lot and you can probably share experiences of yours that yeah. got you to this point. And what stands out to me is it's almost hard for me to title what you are, right? Like, I guess I'd say director. Yeah, that's that, like the. I think that that's is like, the, like that's the I guess the keystone. Right, like that's yeah. your thing that you're fucking great at. However, thank you, bro. The reason that I'm so excited to have you on is because you're also one of those people who's great at a lot of things, and I think to be a director in this day and age, you have to be. So it, yeah, I agree with that. For like sure. you, you can edit, you can shoot video, you can shoot photos, you can put together a whole video. Like yeah, there's you've done commercials, you've done music videos, like you're very yeah. well versed in media and creation. And I'm so interested in that because I think a lot of people will be at a point where they could have a career like that. So having someone like yourself where you're young and killing it, but have kind of figured it out is really rad. So I want to talk a oh, lot yeah, about Thank that. You. I also want to talk about the fact that we accidentally matched yes, today. Love this is that. unintentional and I'm very stoked. It's a good brown you're and like, black you walked combo. Out to the, you walked out to get me and I was like, yo. <laughs> Instantly both of us <laughs> see each other and we just start laughing. I know. Also on the topic of... Uh, of wardrobe. I saw my good friend Mike Koziel was on here. Yeah. Rep in New York. Yeah. And one of our friend jokes is the New York Boston rivalry. So I just had to, had to I had to bust it. out the Boston hat, but had to only for only for the sake of of uh messing with <laughs> Mikey, who I love dearly. I love that the podcast has gotten to a point where so many homies have come on that we can now have inside podcast jokes. I know, and right? Like we can be like, oh, I saw on his episode, he said this I know, and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said that to this. And I, I actually like love that so yeah, much. And no, that's so funny. And, my, and I mean, going off of just like, you know, those, those, those mutual friends who are just like really amazing inspirations. Like Kozil is like, I've known him for almost as long as I've known you, like five years. And I yeah, had, yeah. you know, you meet through the grapevine here in Los Angeles and like, there's some some people you just click with on like a personal and creative level and it's like you know he's somebody who i consider you know a lifelong friend yep. as i would you yeah and like even that we we couldn't be more polar opposite in terms of our demeanors and personalities but like when it comes to just like friendship and creativity like we just gel so well like he shot he has probably shot like 90 percent of all of the projects i've directed wow yeah Wow. That's crazy. Because there's there's two other cinematographers, maybe three or four other cinematographers that I've worked with yeah. who I admire and who are incredible at what they do. But Koziel has, you know, shot a lot because we we first shared a personal friendship. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we also have a lot of the same sensibilities and appreciations and aesthetics and stuff. And like, you know, Ghost in the Shell, he has Major Kusanagi from Ghost in the Shell tattooed on his arm. And like, that is my favorite movie. And like, 
I was going to get the same tattoo. That's so, you know sad. what I mean? Yeah. Different frame of the movie, but like a ghost in the shell tattoo, which I still have to get. I just like, haven't had the time to hit the, hit the tattoo shop. Hey, in two years, you'll do it. Yeah, exactly. Two years <laughs> if from our now. timing is right. It'll be yeah, a two, yeah. year two years. From, two year, every, you know, every, everything I say I'm going to do, it takes two years, but I get it done. <laughs> that sounds bad. I don't mean to say. No, no. I think that, it's but... funny to say because procrastination is like the <laughs> ultimate, like, that is like, the thing I'm always battling, mm. you know? Well, and, you're just doing a lot, dude. You're always fucking working on some crazy shit. Like I can imagine it's that, very hard for you to keep a personal life going. It's, it's a, it's a tough balance, but like going off that, it's like, and, and getting into sort of, uh, I guess the origin story. It's like, my dad is from Medellin, Colombia. Mm. My mom is from, my mom's entire lineage is Massachusetts. Like yeah. Very, you know, salt of the earth, sort of like, blue collar yeah american bostonians they mm -hmm. talk with an accent i don't know what yeah that, yeah that's trying to hide the bostonian well i think that maybe my dad's sometimes it comes out when i'm back home i'll be like that's wicked awesome yeah. get out of here yeah. you know what i mean yeah but at this point it's like i'm so self-aware of it that i'll pull it out as like a joke i see like i do yeah. it with i do it with like mike and the friends i'm like come on get out of here you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> from boston but yeah my parent my mom actually talks like that she's got a hilarious accent wow not hilarious because she'll see this and be like wow you're making fun of me <laughs> she, has, she has like a she has the accent you know <laughs> like it's like you she's like could be a character in the departed you know what that's, i mean yeah. so see what you did <clears throat> my, my dad specifically told me he's like you know i want you to do whatever you want with your life because yeah. my abuela who uh was amazing was a li little more strict with him and was like you need to be an engineer that's how you're gonna make money and like raise a family and have kids that are like able to eat and sleep you know in america yeah is that what he did uh he just wasn't cut out for it like he mm -hmm. like she forced him into an engineering school in Colombia. yeah um he couldn't you know he couldn't cut it as far as i know and she was like pretty you know strict with him about yeah. not pursuing things that he ran, wanted to do and he actually it's so hard and i think that's a generational thing uh, yeah it is you know it especially is. latin americans are pretty regimented and, and and hard on their kids my dad was definitely like he you know he was a good hybrid of like that sort of disciplinarian with also taking from his experiences with my grandparents on his side like you know telling me i want you to do whatever you want to do and i think you know that is how you should live your life but you should be the best at it wow you know he's like if you're gonna do something just strive to be the best yeah and you know he gave up a life in south america because it was getting you know a little too unruly in colombia obviously we all know the pablo story and how the cartels change the the face of that country on a global perspective and also yeah. like on a deep societal level there and like he there's actually a crazy story where I do have a family member who met Pablo because Medellin's like a pretty small city compared to American cities. But crazy. That's a whole other anecdote that I won't oh go down. Oh my God. But fun fact, I am like one degree of separation from Pablo Escobar. That's so Probably insane. more than like more like with more than one one person than just like my second cousin, but either way. Um, but like, it's just interesting hearing you talk about your dad because I think that a common theme even past this podcast is like when kids' parents aren't from the States, like when they're first generation, and I mean, your mom is from Boston, but yeah, I, I, I kind of have that even like my dad is from Europe and like- Oh, where at? Scotland. Oh, dang. Yeah. Does he have the accent? Oh, does he? Sick. Wait, like Glasgow or where is he from? Uh, a little town called Arbroath. That's tiny little sick. fishing town yeah i'm actually going to york which isn't in scotland but it's pretty far north yeah so i want to go to glasgow oh dude i love scotland but yeah. i i think like just parents that aren't from the states when they come to the states they appreciate how much is possible and oh yeah 100 percent. like you always hear that right like you always hear the opportunity and and this like appreciation for the ability to work and i see so many parents that are like first generation in the united states yeah. work so hard and you talk to the kids of those parents and there's something there not always but a lot yeah and it's it's funny to hear you say no, yeah. that and i love your dad's perspective that he kind of shared where I can see it. Like I can imagine him getting a lot of pressure to be something he didn't want to be, gets to the States, wants a better life for his kids, but also yeah. wants his kids to work super hard. Right, for sure. It's like it's like the American archetype of, yeah. the, of the of the immigrant experience. So you it's felt like, that. Yeah. And it was it was really good because I think from a cultural standpoint, I had my dad was, you know, very much like a supporter of whatever I wanted to do as long as I was, you know, good at it. Yeah. You know what I mean? He was like in school, get good grades. You know, um, my, I feel like my generation was like the, like the millennials, like the last bastion of like kids who like necessarily or like thought college was necessary. Yep. So like, you know, he was like, 
you need to go like if you want to go to and like be successful you got to go get a degree like that's like the yep. one of the cornerstones of like the american like immigrant uh very experience much so. for their yeah. kids so yeah. like i went to boston university which is at the time like it was close to my house but it also has like a good reputation it's a great school and i and i love the fact that i went there it's fucking extremely expensive and if it wasn't for my scholarship i think my education would have cost somewhere close to like two hundred eighty thousand dollars, which Fuck. is another systemic problem we won't get into yeah dude but, but you, know, you did have a scholarship i got in with a scholarship Sick. so like the, the grades paid off and you and know what did you study um so i went in not knowing what i wanted to do and like wanted to give myself the ability to sort of figure that out interesting but i knew i wanted to somehow be in like media because it always enticed me like when i was in like well growing up my dad would always watch um like this old 90s show called movie magic okay and it was basically like a behind the scenes of like the like the, the making of jurassic park or like whatever yeah, these huge yeah. Hollywood steven spielberg blockbusters and he was like wow it's so cool man so <laughs> i would watch that with him and then like as far as long as i can remember he would always have like a handy cam or like a i mean back in the 90s like i can barely remember him at disney with like the big shoulder mounted panasonic oh he was wow. like that guy at disney with like, so he was like into like technology and like, he loved yeah, it and he yeah. like always was buying cameras and like you know and that was part of his infatuation with like the accessibility of shit in yeah. america yeah like records and cameras and and you know anything remotely related to like creativity and like yeah like media me and arts making because he wanted yeah. to be a, a draftsman like like drawing which i, I just, oh i think like he thought it was like really cool because it was like illustration in relation to like industry yeah so yeah, like he yeah. saw it as a and it, he did that for a little while so he's always been like infatuated with like the creative yeah so pov like, you like you grew up around that around Dad's that and super i think that excited about yeah it. like that those little sort of like seeds from those like experiences of like you know watching him take photos and film i think made me like have an appreciation for the camera yeah so like when i was in high, when i was in middle school i remember like one of my friends and I would like take a mini DV camera I got for my birthday when I was 13. And like, we would make videos like stop motion videos, yep. but like on tape by like pressing record and then stopping yep. and pressing record. You stitched together in Windows Movie Maker? Dude, not even because I didn't like, our computer was so shitty that I just like would, we would just- You had to use the tape? We would like edit in the tape. It was yeah, so yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I picked up a skateboard when I was 14, okay. started using the mini DV to like yep. film skate videos and yep. stuff and had that moment that we all have like, skateboarding is the yeah, shit i didn't you know? realize you skated it, i skated until i was like 23 and then i like cracked my elbow and i was like yeah. i gotta stop because yeah. i want to use this elbow for other things yeah, you know what fuck. i mean that is like the hard realization of like skating until you break something or fuck something up and it stops you from doing like your other thing yeah. and you're like oh, dude. dude and also the like the backstory behind that accident is i was on I was working for a very high profile director on a very like large budget movie. Yeah. And I just took our day, my day off to go to like the Fuck. local skate park. And this was in like the middle of nowhere, Canada. Fuck. And so I like went, it was like springtime in like Alberta, like right, like two hours outside of uh, Calgary, Alberta. Yeah. Where we were shooting this movie. And I like went dolo to a skate park and like fell and like, I was like, I fucked my arm up. Like I was like, oh shit. Like I wasn't able to move it. And I was so worried that like, cause you know, part of my job on that set was like, I shot some shots for the movie because the director like was like take my camera and go like film nature yeah like, imagery so i was like really worried i wasn't going to be able to use the camera so like after that like moment of anxiety and injury i was like i'm not going to thankfully like the elbow fracture was like something that would heal on its own yeah good yeah. so like i was good but like i was like all right i gotta like if I'm gonna skate, it's just for transportation. Yeah, I'm not gonna like drop in on a quarter pipe. I definitely like did a tour with a broken collarbone and learned that Dude, lesson the hard way. Yeah, that's like the most painful bone to break too. Yeah, it fucking sucked. Who were you touring with? Uh, set it off back in the day. Oh, sick. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. But it was just like I, me. Like, I mean, it was nice because everybody else had to like help load in, and I was just like, "Yep, you're just boys. like, yeah, sorry guys." <laughs> yeah, but Dude, I feel you. Small world. So, set it off. They were playing a show with Divided by Friday. Yeah, back I when I was in college. Love them. Matt Morgan was on the pod. Oh, no way. Yeah. That's the boy. He's like scoring movies and shit. He now, sure right? is. Yeah. Good for him. We yeah. like, I mean, I haven't seen him. I was 18 the last time I saw his ass. So, so crazy. But send him. Yeah. Matt Morgan, if you ever see this, he, go. he might every now and then he'll tap in and listen to an episode. Let's, yeah. let's, let's connect, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but going back to the, just the finishing up the origin story and, and I don't want to leave my mom out of the whole picture because she's also integral. You know, I was really fortunate to have parents that like stayed together and like, were really supportive, which is a rarity. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And that's like a blessing that I don't take for granted at all. But like, you know, my, basically my dad instilled in me, like if you do whatever you want to do, be the best. So I went yeah. to college. Um, and while I was there at BU, 
I was, I decided to major in advertising. I mean, it was an overall sort of like bachelor's of science in communication and their mm -hmm. communication school is like pr very good. I'm not like trying to be a marketing rep for this college, but like, yeah, know, like you enjoyed the school. Howard you Stern went the there. Like they had a lot of really good alumni. Like, yeah. One of my friend's dads went there and, and, and he's a very high profile executive at HBO and like Joe Roth went there. I, I'm pretty sure as an undergraduate and he's like a Marvel producer. Cool. Don't, cool. don't, don't. I think it like is that a maybe? It's a maybe. It is a maybe <laughs> he is a maybe. He is a very high profile producer. I'm not sure if he is exclusively working with Marvel, but I think he may have worked on some Marvel films. Okay. Um, but either way, like the alumni list from Boston University is really good, and yeah. I befriended a few people there who were in the film school, and like Steph Mursky. Oh, that's was, where y'all met. I met Steph Mursky at Boston University, and he was like, "Did he go to Boston University?" Hell yeah! How did I not? I guess I'm I'm like bad at college stuff because I didn't I mean, do it, so like I don't I don't follow it as well. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. I mean, it's like I, that's how I, that's how I met Steph Mursky, and like he was at the time working for like a like a music blog, I guess you would say, and they okay. because of their press status, they could get uh, photo passes. Yeah, and th this we'll get into this later, but like talking about multi hyphenate at the time, I was like producing dubstep in college. Oh no way! And I really wanted to go see Rusko. Like I was okay. just like fucking around yeah. in Ableton. Like I wasn't like producing dubstep. But still you're painting the picture. Like what I'm hearing in that is you are that kid that grew up like similar age, like we're very similar ages. And like, I, I know that feeling of you're into skateboarding. You pick up a camera, you like to film shit, you find music, yeah. you're trying your hand at that. Like you're just generally interested in this kind of like yeah. subculture. And expression like, too. Yes. It's like expression and curiosity. It's like I was the only Hispanic kid at my high school listening to like The Fall of Troy. Wow. You know what I mean? What a deep cut. I love Dude, that. Dude, I saw them like <laughs> for the first time ever. The, the, like the, basically the original lineup with like Tom, the old drummer. They have like a new bass player. Yeah. Play at like uh, Pier 17 or something in New York City. It's like uh -huh. a rooftop venue. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I also saw water parks there like two weeks before, which sick. was dope. That was a full circle moment because I'd never seen the fall of Troy. Yeah, damn. Sick. And you're like listening to him. And yeah. But, but yeah, like that sort of subcultural appreciation and like, mm -hmm. you know, just wanting to like express myself like growing up, like led to me like when I was a freshman in college, like all I did, I didn't go to parties. I like stayed in my room and made Ableton beats and then yeah. played Left 4 Dead too, with <laughs> Random Strangers Online. Like that was my college experience yeah. as, freshman, as a freshman. Anyway, so I was obsessed with Rusko, who was an old school dubstep artist yep. in comparison to like, you know, like he was one of the founders. One of the OGs, of, yeah. He was one of the OGs and like uh, he was playing a show in Boston and Steph Mursky was like, I can get you a photo pass, like if you want. Damn. And he was like, you have a camera, right? And I was like, yeah, I can get one. So a really close friend of mine who lives out here named Chris, um, this dude, Chris Rowe, we have like been boys for like 11 years. Now he's in like VR and he shoots like the Olympics in VR. <laughs> Shit, okay. So like if you're watching the Olympics in VR, he's the one who like shot it. It's crazy. Fucking he's been nuts. to like Tokyo, Beijing, like it's wild. And he okay. shoots him with like these crazy VR setups. So he hooks but you But he up. let he me borrow through. his Canon T2i, which is like OG, you know what I'm, yeah. Get me started on the amount of careers that started, that started on, on the Canon T2i. T2i. Specifically the Canon T2i. Speci that was like the first like under a thousand dollar camera that could shoot like cinematic video. 1080? 1080, yes, 1080p, 1080p, which was like oh, video. Shit. Yeah. And That's, it had like low, you could control the focus and had low depth of field. And yeah, it was dude. Like, you you could, had like dude. a 518 and then like you yes. film video. The classic dude. Fantastic. You can make oh like. Oh my yeah. God. Bro, That's I was using that camera to like film that's tour like, documentaries. Dude, back yes, in that's the like day. the goat. Yeah. Like and I am so. Our generation, out. that camera For started real. so, so many, many careers. Okay, dude. so you get this T2i. So I borrow you go my to boy's the T2i show. and I go to the Rusco show and I'm just like, I, it's in like program auto. It's like one out of every like four photos is usable. Yeah. Thankfully, I only needed to submit like three or four to this like blog called the sound alarm that Steph was working for and or like contributing to um and I wrote like a like a little write up on the show and from then on I start I started to like shoot shows for this blog and they would get me mm. photo passes so I really was like ultimately as I realized I that first after that first show that I like loved using a camera and the idea of like image making yeah you know I started to like divulge and like realized I wanted to like study film. So I picked up a film minor, met a lot of really dope filmmakers at BU. Um, one of the dudes I also studied with, 
uh, his name is Miles Sherman. He's like water parks, his manager now. And like, mm -hmm. that's how small the world is. And wow. So you have a lot of like day ones, like all the way going back to school that have been yes. like still important pieces in your career now. Yeah. And I think that like, wow. you know, keeping like, like friends or fa fr like friends or family, you know what I mean? That's like yeah. my, my philosophy. And like, that's why I've just stayed in touch with everyone. And like, you know, have, we've built together and like yeah. done a lot of cool stuff together. All the people I mentioned previously, like Steph and I, I mean, we've been great friends. We worked on a lot of projects together. Yeah. You know, I know he's like killing it right now with his, I guess what he's doing is like, for lack of a better word, like sort of merchandise website design, which is really cool. Yeah. yeah. And like he's fully freelance, which is amazing. And I know he's always wanted to do that. So big shout out. But like, yeah, we go way back. He was kind of integral in me starting filmmaking. And then right. randomly he was like, hey, I'm managing a band called Carson from okay. North Carolina. Uh -huh. And I think they broke up, but like they were this incredible kind of like, I don't want to say the wrong genre because I know that, but they were like kind of like post hardcore melodic. Sure. And she was like a, the the lead singer was this amazing clean vocalist who like she she was like I don't want to compare anyone to Haley Williams because Haley's a goat, but like she was like yeah, it reminded you of that. Reminded me of Haley Williams. Like it was yeah. like really amazing, like music heavier music with like awesome melodics, and like they were in North Carolina, and Steph was like I'm going down there to like get them in sessions with the. AJ from the dangerous summer. Sure. So I went down there and Steph was like, you want to film a music video? And uh, I was like, uh, sure. Yeah. So that was the first music video I filmed in 2012. Was Damn. Carson, and I had no fucking idea what I was doing, bro. Wow. I just so like, shouts to Steph. Like Steph really Steph, did yeah, see Steph, something in you. Steph like, like not early. is the goat. Yeah. yeah. He put me on. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I got to hit like uh, me. I have not. It, he's like the type of dude I can like not see for a year, which is the case right now. And I'm sorry, Steph, we got a fucking link. Yeah. And then see him. No, like it's like that though. Like, yeah. Yeah. He's in the shadows. Yeah, That's yeah. okay. He's, he's, he's like big behind the scenes. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But anyway, so North Carolina, North Carolina happened. So I direct my first music video there. So my question for you at this time in your life is obviously you had studied a lot of other stuff. Um, leading up to this moment, you had interests in producing your own music. You had skated, you were playing video games online. Like these are a lot, like if you had doubled down on any one of those things that could have been your career. So as you start shooting shows and as you're like starting to film this music video, is it apparent to you at this point that you're like, yo, I want to do this? Or were you still kind of sure. just like For sure. playing with all these I, things? I mean, I was infatuated with the camera like yeah i was obsessed okay and i okay. still am dude i yeah. buy a camera like once a week bro. sick sick my credit card bill is like if you look at it, it's all ebay it's just and like shit. <laughs> ebay and like ebay, bh I'm, photo yeah and i'm just all buying that. shit yeah. from japan you know man my, my collection's nerdy as hell and, I, and that's just something i enjoy you know I think yeah i'll have yeah you know i'd rather be spending my money on cameras than like you know drinks at a bar you know yeah. what i'm saying no i feel you but I'm like, the same way with car parts so. exactly yeah <laughs> you know it's like one of those inexplicable infatuations that's just part of your persona mm -hmm. um but yeah like once i started filmmaking in college i was like this is it bro like i want to figure out how to make money doing this yeah okay cool cool and because you know coming from a like a lower middle class family yeah you know you want to like my mentality was very utilitarian i'm like i if i'm going to have my parents invest in this degree yep even though i had a scholarship you know we still had to put some bread up for this fucking you yeah know, house expense equivalent education right, right and yeah and then you know you appreciate that they're working hard and you know yeah. that it's not just handed to you no i know yeah, and i'm yeah. like you know i i can't like go and like be a starving artist right i'm gonna be a uh, I'm, I'm gonna be an eating artist you yeah know what i mean like yeah I, so quickly in your head you're like all right cool i love this how do i make it a business how do i make exactly money from doing it and you know it's it's one of the things that i that i remember hearing when i first got into like a good university was like it's what you make it it's also who you meet hmm. specifically if you're studying entertainment yeah and you know that if it wasn't for some of the people that i met at bu I wouldn't have been able to get my first gig out here and and i got lucky and and was able to immediately get a job after graduating at a very high profile post-production company oh so yeah so i had you know I'm, I'm i'm still to this day obsessed with computers i'm a computer nerd you know what i mean like yeah, you now, were telling me you were like building a gaming computer last time yep and i did that yeah i have like you know my now now i've got like you know three or four gaming laptops that i use they all serve a purpose i'm not just sure you know, one of them's for gaming one of them's for rendering one of them's for you know, sick, you know. sick. But, but like, yeah. I think that, um, and this goes back to even just me, me messing around in Ableton as a student, as a hobby, yeah, led to my infatuation with like digital creation and how it goes hand in hand with physical production. 
right? So I saw those two things being married when I started to like take the sensibilities I got from like working in like that nonlinear editing space, kind of like, what is this like logic? Yep. Yeah, like that. This this type of shit is is absolutely infatuating to me. Yeah, and like then I started seeing how I could go and be somewhere and 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 be shooting something and be in the world. Yeah, and marry it with my other obsession. Wow, cool. So that's like you why you like, see your digital file that you went and recorded and how you could manipulate exactly. that. Yeah, and it was like the perfect ability to like have my because you know when I'm editing I'm like a very solitary person. I like to like be in the zone and like look at my computer and like just. I have those moments of like this shit's fire yeah yeah and i'm like but i gotta make sure it's fire so i gotta keep doing it you know yeah what I mean? those, so you really did love both yes like, like at that point like that's where it clicked where you're yeah. like okay i love messing with cameras i love figuring these out i love the look that i'll get through this camera and this lens but then when that footage goes to your computer you were equally as obsessed of like yeah exactly whoa so i love both parts that's and, cool and because uh, sure. that's not always the case right no i know people and i mean people you know, it's, it's a person to person thing. There are people who just love specifically being a first AD or like, you know, I think Cozy is a great example of somebody who is just like obsessed with cinematography and that's yes. like his thing. And like, yeah. you know, yeah, he's sure he can edit and he can like, he's, you know, he's got a lot of other talents, but right. like his main passion is, is cinematography. And like, right. And that's like an, his title. Like if you were to really title him, it would be director of photography. Exactly. Right? And that means like, that is like painting the picture that the you lights. see in the video, like exactly. setting it up, like, oh, cool. This is supposed to look like a scene at twilight and this, that, and this, like exactly. he understands right. exactly the lens and, that, and the lighting yeah, and the yeah, exactly. everything. And you know, that, that our, maybe we work so well be, because of our mutual infatuation with the like camera technology and, 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 you know, using lights and all that sort of stuff and and telling stories with imagery yeah but like you know there's levels to it where like yeah. he's much deeper he's like oh yeah check out this like i'm the type of person where like when i'm directing something i i'm not super super like obsessed with like whether it was shot on like zeiss super speeds or like you know to you you see the end picture Cook, pan, for you macros it's like i'm like i just want to make sure that like we get yes the narrative and yeah. it also looks dope yeah yeah yeah. so Whereas you're storytelling like, and you know what it needs to look like you know the feel you know like the general like framing of yeah. the shot and what like and, when lens uh depth and right. stuff but like you don't need to go too much past that like you right. won't lose sleep and, over that no of course and it's not and, and that's the beauty of like different departments in the filmmaking process it's like i don't like i can write a story yeah and you know, you create a mood board and reference imagery and, and create a Bible for the other people who specialize in that. in those specific parts of making the so picture. Cozy will probably loves you because you say, we need this, 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 this shot. It needs to tell this story. It needs to look yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah. And he's like, say less, I got you. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, I'll give him like, you know, mood framework. And then he'll be like, all right, now I can paint. You yeah, know? And sick. And like, it's dope because like the, I mean, you know, we we're, we're bros. We clown on each other. We're yeah. like, you know, I'm sure he'll even see this and like laugh because like our dynamic is like that. But at the same time, it's like, it's, it's a friend dynamic. So, yeah. you know, it's yeah. not as like serious as it may, right. may, may, may sh as it should you be. You could sometimes. make it sound real formal or you could just fuck exactly. with each other and clown you know, on each other. And, and that that's, that's the beauty of, of our bromance. I just wanted to paint the picture of how you got to the spot of you caring about this and starting a career there. Yes, for sure. A really important thing though, that you said in this story that kind of got us onto this tangent was that you loved both, that you figured yes, out yeah, cameras yeah. and then you also figured out editing. So I do want to get deeper back into this. I Absolutely. love that. And I want to start talking about some of the things you've learned and things that people could apply in this day and age to be this multi-hyphenate creative because yeah. I think that's super valuable. But there's one other piece in your story that I really want to get to before we get into that. And mm -hmm. that's how you did make a career out of it. Because right. it sounds like you were just at the beginning of telling me of like, okay, cool. You figured out how to edit. If yep. you were going to do it, you had to figure out how to make money. First so job. how does that play out? First job. Okay. Got you. Um, graduated through YouTube university and my university. I developed a wide range of self-taught and university taught skills. Sick. Um, and I had a connection uh, through a good friend to a potential job out here. And it was crazy because it was like, I flew out. I, re I rented like a, the cheapest car I could rent from like Avis. I was so scared because coming from the East coast, like you perceive LA as this massive place. That's like just a driving city and it's all different neighborhoods. And it's like, you know, yeah, it's just uh, overwhelming. Yeah. It's funny now that I've lived here for eight years, it's not the case, but you know what I mean? I completely, yeah. And like come out and I go and interview at this, this company 
um, that is like a, you know, I later found it as like a super world renowned, like very high profile post-production company. Damn. Um, it was, and the recruiter there, we got along great and she like really liked me and hired me to be, I was just, I, I was just, I needed a job. Yeah. So I didn't care what it was. And I was yeah. a night shift archival assistant, which is okay. hard to explain, but basically like this company is called A52. It was a VFX comp visual effects company started by Angus Wall. He like is the editor on the girl with the dragon tattoo and the social network. Okay. Uh, and he won two Oscars for those films. He's edited, a, you know, tons of stuff. He's like a crazy. Gun, so like fucking I mean? established. He's, yeah. He's like worked with Fincher. Like his company's like insane, insane. They, and now they've, they've, be, they've, I think now they've grown into a much larger conglomerate that does like trailers and does like super high level. They've always done super high level, like opening title sequences and stuff. So I worked at a VFX company. Yeah. Learned a lot there, but I was night, I was night shifting it. Yeah. In the process of working there as a night shift assistant, one of the assistant editors who worked during the day mm. would often stay and work at night. Yeah. And his name was Niles. And I think he runs his own editing company. But one, one thing he said to me that resonated that I think is really important for all creatives is like, I was like, I was like, damn, bro, you're like, cause he had to be in, be at work the next day at 8 AM. You know what I mean? But he was there till like midnight editing his own projects. Mm. And I was like, damn, bro, how come you're like doing that? I feel like you'd be like really tired. He's like, he's like, dude, if like you're not taking the advantage of your resources and putting in that extra work, you might as well get a job at like Walmart. That's literally what he said, which, oh, sounds, dude. which sounds a little, I mean, it's a little bit. No, like, that is huge. It's brutally honest. And like, that was a click moment for me. And I was like, he's right. So when I wasn't working like on the company's, uh, you know, all of my, on my list of to do things for the company, I was just teaching myself everything, learning VFX. Like they let me use some of their computers there, like in the editing room. And I yes. would just like learn these softwares Yes, and like better my knowledge. Yes, and that was like dude. real world experience to the point where like some of the assistant editors that were working there would be like, Hey, you want to like help me? Like I need, I need you to like uh, break down all this Nicki Minaj footage. So because of the, the environment that I was in, it was very high profile shit. You know? Dude. Okay. That that's, I'm so glad you just said that. I'm so glad you shared that lesson. That like, initiative is key. This is a really important part in your career though. So Absolutely. like, I, I was really lucky to get the job there first of all. Yeah. And I was around super high level people. So yeah. I kept my head down. I listened and I worked. And you could learn from truly Dude, yeah, exceptional like, people bro, like, quickly. Yes. Like yeah. Dave Chappelle's writer was in the same room as me. Cause yeah, I got promoted wow. there halfway through to being the assistant to the colorist whose name was Paul. Wow. Yukono, and he's. Can I ask how much money you make doing something like that? Bro, I was making like 600 a week. It was dog shit. Okay, cool. The but, reason that I asked that to paint that picture is I'm like, I wonder like, is that a, is that a position where you could get cocky and like put your feet up and be like, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life? Hell or, no. Bro. Okay. It's no, low you're enough making like, where... you're making like what somebody would make working, uh, a lot of hours at Starbucks. You know okay. What I mean? like, okay. So like you're there because you want to be, and it's like, that's another yeah. reason that like, you need to learn everything. Yeah. Because it's like my, my payment is going to be my connections. The payment was as much. Yeah. The, okay. The, cool. the, the, the the mistreatment of low level people in the film industry is a whole other problem. Yeah. Okay. Like that just lines, lines up with the, there's a lot of flaws in the film industry. Yeah. Um, but like, I was blessed to be in that environment mm -hmm. and like I was 21. So I wasn't okay. going to be like, I cool. need more money. Cool. No, that, like, that's I just, like, I, I like, wanted to hear that because I'm curious of like, if you're 21, you make it out in LA, like in this moment, are you head down, need to learn everything or are dude, you like I was about like, to be the cockiest motherfucker in no, the world? Bro. Like, first okay. of all, in that environment, I was like a fucking, I was like a crumb. I got to know everyone on a nice personal level, even the super high up people who at first didn't even like perceive me as an organism to the mm -hmm. point where like everyone, everyone in that office, like liked me and knew me. Yeah. Wow. And that's key, man. It's like, yeah. not on some, like, you know, like I was just, that's just my energy. Like I'm friendly with everybody Yeah, you are. because yeah. you know, that's just, I think how you should be. Mm -hmm. And that, that comes from like, maybe because my dad is like that. He's friends with everybody. I'd always notice how everyone loved my fucking goofy ass dad. Yeah and my mom, but like yeah. my dad for the most part, because my mom was the breadwinner growing up. Oh, crazy. So I had a very matriarchal family, which is like another, you know, plus, but like my dad was, I was around my dad a lot growing up and I just saw how he interacted with people and yeah. was never, was never hot with anybody. Like, even if something wasn't going the way he wanted it, like he was just like smile on his face, like Figure I'm in America, that. baby. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah, it. yeah, I love that. So at this facility, I just kept my head down and I did the maximum mm -hmm. that I could, mm -hmm. even though I was like, like the minimum person there. Incredible. You know I mean? Incredible. And not to sort of like blow smoke up my ass, but I was just like, that was my like 
energy because I was like lucky to be there. Like it there was wasn't so lost many, on you. Like you so really many, appreciated yeah, what that was. was. Like, you dude, knew what it was. Exactly. Especially was, after that homie gave you that piece of advice. Yes. You were just locked. I was like locked in. I was like, yeah. I got to take advantage of it. Yeah. Like I was asked, I was given a promotion yep. um, later that year to assistant colorist or yeah, assist, I guess assistant colorist. I was mm -hmm. or colorist assistant either way. So the, the colorist in the filmmaking process is the person who goes through and takes the raw footage yeah. and makes it look completely different and gives it a, like an, an incredible mood. Yeah, it, it makes like the log look vibrant and exactly. good. Yeah. yeah, you know what it is. Yeah. And this guy was like super high level. He colored like episodes of House of Cards. Like he colored the Game of Thrones intro. The dun, 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 dun. Like he colored that. It's got crazy, to go. crazy. It's like little Australian dude named Paul. God bless him. I, I need to link with him. because Yeah, find that dude. When A five two. A52, which I think is an abbreviation for Area 52. Like oh, a cool. joke on Area 51. Um, so I just, I was a sponge there. And I how just, long were you there? I was only there for a year and a half. Okay. Because I met someone there. He was really dope assistant editor slash editor. His name was Eric. He's a homie. And he was like, hey, like there's an opportunity for somebody with your sort of like diverse skill set. Because while I was there, everyone kind of knew that I was like able to do everything. Like yeah. they would ask me to Photoshop some shit for an assistant editor. I would, yeah. I would make a graphic or I would animate something or I would render something out. Or I was like a master of codex and like mm. video codex. So I was able, I was like this sort of like multi-hyphenate in terms of like digital video yeah, and like yeah. understanding like post-production software. Yeah. And just also having a level of creativity to it. Like I wasn't just right. Like a this is a very you're painting that picture well, like where you're you're creative. Like you you do want to make stuff yourself yeah, and, and I love was, cameras, but your technical knowledge was actually rather extensive and that wasn't yeah, an accident. You were actually, actively trying to learn that. And while I was at that company, I also like edited and ran their podcast, which was pretty cool. No way. Like in the, yeah, it was random. Dude, it was a lot. It was dope. The company was amazing. The people there were great. God, that's I, I had I a love, good experience. It's a really cool part of your story. And I think that that sets a great example for anybody listening to the podcast of like, find those those opportunities where it's not money, but it's experience. God, I just made a lot of friends and man, I was just like hungry as fuck to be there. Like, Cause there, there's another piece now that my natural question, and I, I wanna hear about you working with the, the director, Eric. Uh, no, Eric was the guy who connected me to the director. The director's oh. name was Albert. Okay, so I, I wanna hear about that, but then like kind of what I'm trying to get to is what really stands out to me or, or where I'm curious now is with that uh, story leading up to where you're at now, I would almost imagine you to be more in Hollywood and more in like major motion pictures, yet For a sure. lot of what you're doing is with artists and with music videos, you work with record labels, you have done a lot of I commercial mean, the, 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 work, the, the, but I'm done, curious the how The short that, answer to that is yeah. you gotta pay rent, man. For me, it's like common knowledge. It's like directors started music videos. It's like no a way. training ground. Yeah, bro. What? Nope. Like it's right. like a training ground because you get to develop your voice in a yeah. creative atmosphere for the purpose of something that is people want to watch. Nobody wants to watch commercial. So this is a chapter though. Like this will be a chapter and you yeah. will continually graduate and you are going to get into major motion pictures and for filmmaking, sure. storytelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy shit. That's like the goal. Oh my God. For some I reason. You know, everybody develops a persona on online. I, I just post my work online. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying? Like the, I think something that did stand out to me about you is we all, you and I both know, the people that got a little too stuck in Warped Tour world. Where like, bro, I, I come from that. I'm very openly, like I, I so proudly promote that like that I went on was Warped the Tour. college of my life. Dude, same, I went on Warped Tour. However, that's a chapter, that's college. You have to graduate, grow oh, yeah. up and go do your I, thing. Everything is a, like, I love the fact that I get to make music videos for a living. Right, right. Like, well, what I was gonna say to finish that thought is, I've never thought of you as Warped Tour scene guy. I've known that you've worked with scene bands and done videos, but really from, from very early on, you don't just pigeonhole yourself to that. No, yeah. So that I, is something that I've noticed in your career is that you do commercial work, that you do work with artists way outside of that scene, yeah, even done, though that was like a, a No, a I mean, part it, was, of it. it was part of my sort of like personal appreciation and DNA and, and yeah. just inherently like, like I just grew up liking bands like the Wonder Years and Title Fight, and I wanted to like sick. You just wanted to be a part of that. You just yeah. wanted to help out, and I, you know, and being a visual creative and working with them is like is a fulfilling thing. But I'm not, that's you know, not who you are. That's no, not like no, no, the no, defining no, you, no, no. and that's so it's just it. one of the elements of like the the type of work I do. Like I've worked with everyone from like Jesse J to Two Chains to Ti to Boozy to like Rich the Kid to like Joel Madden. Right, you know what I mean. So yeah. the spectrum of the type of music 
I've worked with to musical artists and, and legends I've worked with is wide in terms of their overall audiences. Fucking but all crazy. Of that, Sidebar, in like, my opinion, The Wonder Years is the best pop punk band ever. And dude, will always be. I, yes. yes. I would almost like when I was like uh, 19, I almost got like, I think it was like Washington Square Park, like a, a lyric tatted on me. Hell yeah. I used to be super, Hell yeah. I used to love those motherfuckers, man. Their shit was like dope in college. Dude. Now I re-listened to it and I was like, man, I was a pretty bummed out kid. Yeah. Because I'm listening to like, Heat and shit now, but yeah, that's so um, funny. The, okay, so just to go off of what you're saying and bring it back to what yeah. I was talking about, I worked for those for that director. It was an incredible experience. A because what he was looking for was a visual assistant, and okay. he has one on all of his movies. He wrote the script. He wrote the story. I mean, he he some he wrote the script with a couple people, but his it's a, his story, and it was like a prehistoric coming of age slash. I don't want to spoil it, but it has to do with a, a canine. Sure. Story, but I would say a coming of age story, kind of, yeah. and it's a survival story. Yeah. Um, when I was at the post production company, I was like, I love this. I love everyone here, but I don't want to sit at a desk the rest of my life. Mm. That's me personally. I want to be on set because I know I can do it all. Yeah. And the director that I worked for was one of those guys. Like he edited the fucking partial parts of the movie himself. Like he wow. could edit. He taught himself a lot, but in the 90s. So he was doing it like the analog way. Crazy. Sensibility wise, though, it's that same sort of like fa infatuation, fascination, and like overall grasp of all of those different elements of the process. Yeah, yeah. And while I was there, I like learned from him, spent a lot of time with him and was behind the monitor all the time. And mm. like when the movie wrapped up, like 2017, I was just about to be 26, no, 25. Yeah. I was like, I wanna direct, like I wanna figure out how to do this. It lined up with me starting to like make connections mm. um, in music. My first like over five figure budget was a Chase Atlantic video for a song called Triggered. Sick. And then I ended up doing, I think after that, I think I've done like 10 videos with Chase. So wow. I yeah, I know. Guys. I feel like that's like a, I think of Chase Atlantic music videos and it's just you. Like that's. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Like now that Clinton is like kind of the director, which is really dope because I love Clinton. Yeah. And we all. In the do. band, right? Yes. Yeah. And he's also a big nerd when it oh, comes to really? like loving, like creating and like he's a big fight. He's like a. Fire. They're all kind of nerdy, huh? It's the best. Yeah. I don't know them too, too well. Like Jordan's the homie and I've met love Mitch Jordan, yeah, through yeah. her. And they're like, like they're, him, they're he like, he seems like he's like music nerd. They're like the he, coolest nerds. You yeah. Know, you yeah. Get, like they're the coolest looking motherfuckers. But when you meet them and you see their process, they're you're actually like, they're just like, like nerds. Yeah. I love like, that. That's like sick. Be like, oh, dude, I love Final Cut. <laughs> and like, tell me all about these dope, like CG renders he's doing in Final Cut. And they had their creative director. His name is on Instagram is just create. Oh, wow. Oh, I've seen him. Tall around. blonde guy. He's cool. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. I think his, uh, he, he likes to be called create. But he's Chris. I mean, honestly, respect for getting that tag. I'm if I had, I'm almost positive it's Chris. If I had that tag, I, I got like, Everybody Google, calls me that. Google Chris after this, yeah. or Google his name, and just we'll we might him. have to edit out. But, but either uh, way, he now he and Clinton make all their videos now. Sick. But like early on, like you know, Naveed, who I mentioned earlier, who is is their manager now, and uh, Naveed's business partner, Mike Lev. We worked pretty heavily with Chase, and like for me, that was a huge learning experience to take what I saw on the big sets and tr start to like put it into practice, right? Yeah, yeah. Clearly, I would imagine that all these people that you're meeting, they can tell that you truly give a shit, that That's you're putting thing, in man. the extra hours, that you're you're obsessed with your craft and learning, and I think yeah. everybody respects that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I feel weird being like the the subject of a podcast. Bro, I, I, uh, you're telling me. Because I'm always like, and I don't, I don't want anything that I'm saying to come off as in any way. That's like my job like, though, is like, I'm the host. Like I get to gas you up and be like, you're fucking killing it. And you just yeah, get to sit there and be like, all right, thanks, I guess. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it feels, it feels, it's, it's nice. And it's funny because like, I, I pride, not pride myself, but like, I don't really go out at night. Like I mm -hmm. sit and I fucking edit. Yeah. Or I learn how to do something. Like mm. yesterday, I was on a Discord. Discord is crazy. No way. shit, dude. For, for your for industry, remote editing. I did a remote editing session with this really amazing band called the Phony People. Uh huh. Dude, they're fire. These dudes are sick. Five yeah. piece band from Brooklyn. Do like funk hybridization. Mm -hmm. But I yesterday my day was like doing a like a four hour remote editing session with them, and then I was gonna come home and edit something else but i ended up like getting coaxed into going out and partially was like fuck i want to go home and edit do you feel like a guilt like i actually legitimately feel Hell like yeah, guilt dude. when i'm like just out doing recreational things and i think that's like it's, good and it's a bad balance. you have to it's a, everything is a balance yeah you know what i mean i think yeah. that like you just have to especially like as i was growing you know in my 20s i realized like 
sleep is sometimes more important than productivity because it's easier to be productive the next day and the next day if you're getting adequate sleep. Yeah. So you can't burn yourself too thin. You can't, yeah. And you can't burn but, the candle at both ends either. Yeah. Then you but have it, no it, it seems to me though, like your, your priorities definitely put mastering your craft and working above just like typical LA socialite stuff. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could like, I could give a shit about going out and like, right. You work on this incredible movie. You know that you're going to, you like, you feel it. You're like, director, I want to do that. You meet Chase. I was like, yeah, you I was get like, to do music videos. This guy's, this guy's killing it. He's dope. I yep. want to do what he does. Mm -hmm. Like, he was, like, he's a phenomenal director. Yep. He's a legend. Yep. He also was a person of color, which yep. I really resonated with because I think the film industry is, is, doesn't have that population in as large of a yeah. place as it should Having be. Having representation around in anything. So, yeah, is it, was, good. it was cool yeah. to see somebody, you know, like, uh, a, a, a person of color leading that level of a production. Right. It was amazing. It was so like, this, this, this dude's dope. I'm blessed to be here. Yep. That was my philosophy the whole time. And, you know, so you do I was that. young and, and it was as much of a sponge as I could be. Well, okay. So this is really interesting though. So you go do that and then you're like, all right, director, that's it. And then it seems like you probably then go even further into like master your craft as that. And music videos, which I'm just learning now, is the medium that lets you craft and perfect that muscle as a director director for sure and earn your stripes absolutely interesting I, there are a lot of have you seen everything everywhere all at once i have so that first of all is like my new favorite movie bar none like I, that movie yeah. is is incredibly well written uh -huh. it's incredibly executed yeah i don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole but the daniels are the uh -huh. two directors daniel Scheinart and daniel kwan yeah and they came from the music video space. Like no they did way. turn down for what? The DJ Snake video. No way. And if you watch that video That's funny. and then watch everything everywhere, you'll see so many visual similarities in the way things are executed. Yes. And talk about multi hyphenate. Those guys were big After Effects, Adobe, like gods in mm. their careers as music video directors. And then from what I understand, they did a lot of their, their own VFX in the film with like four other guys. Wow. Which is kind of unheard of. Like, you know, you don't hear about Scorsese sitting in After Effects and like making a shot. Right. And I think that when they did that, you can see their DNA in the film. Yeah. So having that, it's almost like because of technology's democratization and because of the nerdy obsession of a lot of filmmakers with technology yeah. and the marriage of storytelling and those techniques, things are getting better. There are better movies. Right. It's like, you know, right. obviously the, 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 the filmmaking as a medium or as a creative endeavor is changing it is. every day. Ooh, you're leading me to a question that I have. Like you have Cole Bennett making videos on an iPhone. It's dope. Dude, it's so sick. And editing on an iPhone. I edited a TikTok on my iPhone the other day and I was like, I, I was like, yeah, hell yeah. Like this is sick. And then I, the old me stepped away and I was like, this would have been fucking impossible four years ago. Yeah. Literally impossible. Yeah. Damn near. I know. know. The one of my editors, on iPhones are insane. One of my, one of the, one of my good friends and editors, his name is Jacob Giesman. Shout out Jacob, that JPEG. Check him out on Instagram. There we Phenomenal go. Phenomenal editor. He started popping on his IG with videos he was editing on his iPhone. Wow. Like an artist like saw his shit and hired him and brought him out on a tour. Off and of his iPhone shit. Off his iPhone shit. And it was mad funny because like, dude, I literally didn't have a laptop. I was filming him and then editing on my iPhone on the tour bus. And they were cool with it. Yeah. They were yeah. like, dope. I think that's the future, honestly. For sure. I heard this thing and I was like, yeah, fuck, that's real. Like, we are going to have a generation of kids that have very successful careers and they won't know how to use cameras that you know how to use. They'll know how to do something all on iPhone. 100%. And they'll be better than you at it. Oh, and yeah, they'll be sure. that's that'll be the thing that if people you don't, want. If you don't catch up, like, yeah. like I have a understudy slash, she's not really my assistant, but she's an aspiring director. She's like selling her, I swear to God, dude, she's selling her like DSLR yeah. so she can buy an iPhone 13. Sick. Which is great. Sick. I mean, the only, the I think that the only sort of like, counter argument to that is that when you have an understanding of the exposure triangle that is manipulatable on a manual camera yeah. which you the thing is you can do that now with with iphones with an app yeah so as long Wait, as you, when under, you that's cool though i like the way you said that i've never heard anyone say the exposure triangle are you talking about aperture, aperture ISO, iso and shutter speed, and shutter speed? Okay. yeah so the exposure triangle it's like you know you can only go in certain areas of the triangle and have the image it's like you can't have all of them sick you can't have low shutter like low iso whatever low it, it, what, I, yeah it Cool. The exposure triangle is something in Google. It's it's a nerdy thing. But sick. I've never heard. I've been yeah, familiar out of necessity, but I've never heard that. That's cool. Like I, I I think the iPhone is insane. It's a basically a, it's a camera tool. I've used iPhone 
clips in recent projects. Yeah, sick. Um, the only thing that I think you could say as a counter argument to well, having that be your sole tool is like you don't have, unless you download an app, the quick accessibility to the manual controls and understanding yeah. that. And I think yeah. that that, for me, it was a pretty, like knowing those manual controls allows me to seamlessly communicate with a cinematographer no matter who they are. Yeah, like yeah, I can that's, be like, that's I, true. Like if, I, if I'm gonna set and like, I don't like the way something looks and I know how to articulate to that cinematographer, like, hey, let's let's stop it down once and then I want you to crank to 1250 the ISO so we get that nice grain that the sure. Alexa has, you know what yeah. I mean? Like those are the things that you, if somebody like her, she wants to be a director like running the show, having those deeper knowledge, deep, deeper pieces of knowledge about the, the mechanics of a camera yeah. are key. However, in terms of accessibility to, the ability, accessibility to creativity. Yes. Like the iPhone is like Unreal. insane. Yeah. Unreal. Dude, there's augmented fucking reality. It's insane. I'm pointing down at my iPhone that's below us, yeah. but yeah. there's augmented reality. You can edit on it. It's insane. It's amazing. And it's basically sort of like going off of the multi-hyphenate topic. It's like, you know, you can make a whole short film on your iPhone yeah. and it allows people to become multi-hyphenates by learning those softwares. Right. It's like on one stop. It's like you can't film on your fucking laptop, but you can edit on it. But now you can do all of that on your iPhone. Exactly. Exactly. It just, it, it makes it that much more accessible. Um, okay. So there's two really important things that I still want to talk about, Yes. but I think we can consolidate it well. And we're talking about multi-hyphenate. So I'm going to start here and then I'll bring, I'll come to my next question. Yes. But now that I understand your story more and I like the depth and dynamic to the story is insane to me. I want to hear your advice, your perspective of if somebody is listening to this, like I can't help but think about Diana, my incredible editor who's Deanna. been like ride or die. Like I Hell think yeah. she'll have a career similar to yours. You should link us. I absolutely will. Uh, but speaking of me thinking of her, but this could literally be anybody, but somebody who is maybe fresh out of college or like really finding this career, like finding, like picking up a camera, editing any bit of that and being like, yo, this could be it. I'm curious what your advice is to that, but okay. it's also a two-part question because I don't, I'm curious what you think the skills are that somebody should learn in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And I think you touched on it a little bit with the iPhone and the exposure triangle, exposure triangle. Yeah, exposure yeah. triangle. But like, yeah, I'm curious, like what your advice is and also what you think the future of that holds to like really get that and to become yeah. a you, a multi-hyphenate <laughs> of 2022, 2022 right now as we're recording this, but hopefully this is slightly timeless. Yeah. Yeah. A multi-hyphenate storytelling director. Yeah. Who also What's that look like? How do you do that now? Moonlights as a DJ and scores his own short film sometimes. Yeah, that. That's been a fun little endeavor is like, cause now that filmmaking is making my rent money, mm -hmm. like. I'm like, what do I, what can I do that's creative? That's not stressful yeah. financially. Yeah. And so I've just been fucking around at Ableton again. It's great. Yo. Well, that'll actually come back to the next question that I'm going to ask okay. you. So for now. Yeah, yeah. The, so the, the, well, I mean, first of all, even, even though I may have had like a lower middle-class upbringing, mm -hmm. you know, com in comparison to the, you know, the wealth gap in the U S like, you know, that would be where I, where I said, like, I was still had a really great family. I didn't grow up in too dangerous of a neighborhood, like whatever. I understand the privilege of, of getting an education and mm -hmm. how that is not afforded to everyone. Mm -hmm. However, now all of that knowledge, all of it and more, it's like a master class of, of a wealth is all available online now. Like the, the interviews with like the master classes is, is, is a, is a, I'm not trying to promote that, but I'm saying like, that, cause I know it's like a company. That idea, you, the you can, idea that these incredibly qualified professionals are sharing information on the internet. Yeah, you can go and watch a three hour interview. You can go listen to the A24 podcast with the Daniels who I mentioned before and hear about their process. You can go watch a three hour, you know, Virgil Abloh interview, anything. interview at Harvard or at yeah. the, you know, Chicago Museum. I'm, I don't know which Chicago Museum, in Chicago. You, yeah. can go watch, you can go watch Virgil Abloh speak freely about his process for like, four hours, you know, and that applies to anyone. Yeah. Whether it's the Daniels or Scorsese or Spike Jones or Spike Lee or whoever. And if you have an internet connection, you can really get a lot of that foundational high level, yeah. you know, previous generational knowledge and combine that with what the kids on the same platform, yeah, TikTok, YouTube, whatever are doing today. And I think that if you're not taking all those extra hours of your day to like learn something new or experiment, yeah or go out and shoot. Like I used to just walk around with my camera and just take photos of shit, yeah. you know, which is what a lot of photographers do. But when learning the camera, it allowed me to like experiment and learn that. So it's like, yeah. 
go the extra mile and and kind of going back to what that assistant editor said to me in the machine room that day at my first job out here. It's like, if you're not doing that and going the extra mile and taking all as much time as you can to better your craft and your career, you're not doing yourself the justice of putting yourself in the place where that you want to be later. And I'm not at all a proponent of hustle culture. I think that the whole like work hard, no matter what, sleep little, yeah. it's horseshit. It's, it's yeah. unproductive. But I think that, and I mean, I'm still a big Casey Neistat fan, but he was like early in the 2017s was like, in 2017 was like, he was a big spreader of that. Yeah. And I think well, that that's kind of, it's kind of, it, those, the those idea behind it is good, but it can get taken out exactly. of context and go too far. So For sure. Easily. I think hustle culture what is, you're is saying, what I'm saying is like within the, within the, within reason, yes, you know, and taking care of your mind and body as well. Yeah. Go and learn as much as you can, because it's all there. Let me get more specific because I love what you're saying, but yeah. I'm thinking of myself and I'm thinking about like, that's almost overwhelming. To say like, cool, it's all out there. Go and Sick. learn. Yeah, like yeah. that's, I mean, I like, you can look at your phone and you can, oh, like, I could Google anything and learn anything. Yeah, true. I can go, I can oh, go specific. Whoops. I'm just scrolling on Instagram and TikTok. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. But I think that the reason you get caught in that and that you don't Google and learn everything is you don't know where to start. You don't know what questions yeah, to ask. Yeah, for sure. From a filmmaking so, standpoint, I can definitely give the, like the good sparks. Yeah. Like, like for you, like, cool, all the resources there. Something that I heard in your story and maybe I'm speaking for you, but I think that you had a clear next path all along. Like you met a director and then you were like, cool, I want to be a director. So I would imagine if somebody's listening to this and your, your advice of it's all there is as soon as you have that spark of, I want to be a director, you just start Googling and finding all of the most successful yeah. directors that you love the most, that you resonate with the most. But like what, what are the questions you ask yourself to then go on your learning sprees? Like what, what hmm. thoughts, what questions do you have that then provoke your next quest for knowledge? Right. I think what would always spark sort of like my next quest would be finding things by happenstance sometimes that were like incredible pieces that I was a big fan of. Mm. You know what I mean? Like when I was in school, I was, I would, I saw a music video that I later come to learn was shot on 35 millimeter. Ah. And then I spent so much time understanding the history of film. Ah learning how to shoot film, mm -hmm. motion picture film, and learning how it's color graded and how it, it is texturally different from digital. digital. Yeah. And that's like, that, that, that I think is a great way to like, yeah. it, it give yourself the avenue. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, if I see, if somebody wants to learn how to be a podcaster mm -hmm. or whatever, or start their own podcast, yeah, yeah. they can like see the podcast they really like. And like, you know, then look up the microphone brand or like yeah. start to like go down the more specified route of right. tutorial videos. If we're talking about YouTube knowledge. Yeah. I think a lot of the, a lot of the, for me, a lot of the growth that I had was extracurricular. Yes. It was like I, I doing very and experimenting much with the tools that I was able to get my hands on as much as possible. But you answered your question or you answered my question very well. And you maybe didn't realize it of, the way that you started to ask questions and learn was finding and researching the things that you loved. So yes. you saw a video shot on 35 mil and you didn't know necessarily what that no was, but what you was. saw something where you're like, wait, I love this. Like, why does this feel the way it is? Right. Yeah. So I think that's where it starts, right? Is yes. wherever the creative you or creative anybody watching or listening has those things where they like are a little more gravitated towards can't put their finger on it, but right. it's like, wait, I really resonate with this. Like, wait, I loved the way that this was edited. Maybe they saw the Cole Bennett video that was shot on iPhone. Right. Like, why does like, this look a little bit different? Like, why is this, why, then you why does my iPhone like, footage not look like this? How to edit a video on an iPhone, how to get footage to look like that. Like right. that's your starting point starts with the thing that you can't put your finger on the curiosity yeah. or the fascination. And you just start asking questions about and, what it is and, you see. And you can peer behind the curtain nowadays. It's like yeah. even Cole Bennett puts up behind the scenes of his videos. And yeah. He gives, and like he, you could, but the whole iPhone video, you know, series that he put out, he gives a lot of insight in mm. the actual videos to what was happening and, sh and kind of like allows right. the next generation of filmmakers to realize, you know, how things happen. Sick. That's and, cool. And that answers remove that well. the complexity. It's like, yeah. And I think that now every young creative or person or old creative who wants to start something yeah. has the ability now to peer behind the curtain yep. and see how they did everything, Yeah, you know, and, or at least to an extent, and then they can extrapolate because finding your own creative soul is important. I think yes. that like, there's a lot of people who in like unintentionally will see something they like and then just emulate it. Yeah. Being able to extrapolate 
as opposed to emulate is yes. key. Wow. And like find those two or three things that you like about a creative thing or right. creator. Yeah. And then say, all right, now I'm going to inject my DNA and grow a whole new right. plant. That's kind of like the TLDR of that book, Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. Exactly. It's like, take the shit you love, but don't copy it. Don't copy like, it. Grab it's, like, it's like steal, not copy or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I think that like, you know, there's another documentary from like 2015 called Everything is a Remix. And you mm. realize how, for the most part, all of the in, like big influential creative milestones that have happened were built on top of like other ones. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, from the, that's okay. That's okay. As long as it's your not, own, it's not, you're not yeah. mimicking. You're just taking inspo. Right. Okay. Um, so then wait, this is the perfect thing that gets me to my last question. Yes. So my last question is as I'm learning and as a friend, legitimately feeling a little bit bad that I think I got you wrong. Like I think that I, for, I, I don't think so. I mean, okay, look, maybe that's being a little dramatic, but <laughs> I, I didn't realize that there was so much more to you past what you're at right now. And that's my final question is now understanding that and understanding that there are so many chapters to your story and you see this linear bit of growth and evolution. What do you see next? Like, what are your current goals? Like, you've clearly Ooh. you've been killing it with music videos like so Thank much to know. the point where i'm like oh yeah you're the music video guy Which but now fine. i'm learning i'm like oh wait there's so much more so like yeah will I mean, it will it be short films next or like are you sure. going to be a director of major motion pictures like what do you yeah, like I think it's all what's that look like to you as you paint it any way you could that's a great question um i think that well first of all it's like i know where I'm going because it's, I, I, it was like a podcast or something where I saw somebody say, make a mental image of who you want to be. Yeah. And I finally have started to paint the picture of that person and they're a little skinnier. Cause right now I'm a little overweight, but that's besides the point. <laughs> that's besides the point. Dude, what Deanna, you're saying, yo, do some after effects on me and make me look just a little, <laughs> make me look as, as, as good as Andrew. Dude. Um, well, like I'm so locked right now though of like, be the person that you want to be. That is like, such like, a, like it's manifestation. I mean, I like, think about be, do have, um, Oh, tell me. Oh my God. So I think we're saying the same thing, but like, I, I love that you're saying this right now. Yeah. So a lot of people get it backwards and they want have, do, be, right? So they want to have all the things. They see the person, the successful director, and they're like, I want to have that, right? But in order, like people flip it. So I think first you need to be that person. Yes, like in 100%. Your, in your cell, yeah, in your head, totally, you yeah. can say, what is that successful director? Who, like, what is the beingness of that person? And then what are they doing? Right, and what then are the steps are taking Consequently, to be that you will person. have those things. Yes, exactly. People flip it that's and get it backwards. That's, that's, that's 100%. It's, that, okay. is, that is, that is ver, not verbatim, but that is essentially. That's the idea. That's the, that's the core idea of what I'm saying. It's and like, how are you interpreting that? So, so it's you like, are being For me, being it's like, I see myself as, you know, a director storyteller from a main shtick standpoint with a lot of side hustles. Um, but like I have an image of like a, a, a major motion picture director and I'm sticking to the steps that will get me to that. And I know for a fact that that's writing shorts, producing and directing my own shorts. That's what I'm working on now. Doing music videos that have more, more, maybe more narrative substance that will also allow me to like train towards that. Not that I wouldn't do a music video that's just performance based because you can still make it look cool and inject right. your own visual voice to that. But, but when you look at the linear progression, does that actually get you closer to where you want to go? And right. That's and that's probably you know, just a paycheck. And later in a, yeah, right. There's the, you have to mitigate the paycheck with whether it's not worth or not saying no. Um, and that's something that every creative will battle with is like, do I say no to this? Mm. You know, because that time could be utilized better for this. Yeah. And now, now I've said no to things because and politely, yeah. you know, just to that, because I know that I could allocate my time to what i really want to do yeah um so it's short is, films right now yeah so the next the next the short the short term step is the short film yeah then adapting that into a feature yeah uh and approaching the proper channels to turn that into something and and hopefully it'll still continue to build like every sort of like archetypal director story um yeah but, you know in in the, the other lanes if it's a highway like the director story is like the big 18 wheeler for me and like the other things that I'm doing, it's like starting uh, like a clothing brand with one of my best friends who's an artist who's wanted to start a clothing brand with me. It's like, I'm that's an, I love illustration and I do design work. So I'm like gonna do that Easy. with her, you yeah. know? That sounds really fun and if it makes money, great. It's like a guy who I flew out to compose my one of my short films ended up like sitting in the studio with me for like two days and making dance music. So we have like a DJ duo that's fun. It's like- So you're very are, creative, like it's that's just like still other, there. It's like, it's like the only way I like, it's like, it's it sounds a little bit like hyperbolic, but like, I forget who said it, but it's like, 
if I'm not being creative, I might as well be dead, which sounds really dark and hyperbolic. Yeah, but, but I like, feel it. And especially for an like, artist, it's like, what's the fucking point? If it's you're like, not well, how that? do we mitigate this? Like, you know, not like shitty life, but like the, the, the difficulty of life without expression. And if yeah. you're born to be a creative or you want to be a creative or whatever, it's like, you should be expressing yourself in multiple ways. Yeah. And like, I feel like all of the really influential creative people do that. Yeah. It's like Virgil Abloh is a DJ. He's also yeah. a filmmaker, you know, rest in peace to the guy. He's one of the greats. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, he's a multi-hyphenate polymath, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and we are in an age now, I feel like, and more so in the future where people can be poly or uh, multi-hyphenates. Yeah. Uh, and it's widely accepted. Yes. Like Virgil Abloh played Coachella, but he also directed a little Uzi video that's like legendary and so on and so forth. And yeah. I'm using his, him as an example because he's really well known. Yeah, no, but um, that is a great example. And I, I love that so you're speaking many, to that. Yeah, so many. I mean, you look at the Daniels too. It's like they're phenomenal storytellers, writers and directors. But they're also incredible VFX artists and editors. Yeah. So it's like now because of the digital age, we can do all of that. And if you're not taking advantage of it, you might be doing yourself a disservice. So you just got to hold yourself accountable to yourself, the person you want to be. Bro. Take the steps, take the steps that you know, or take the steps that that person would take to get to where they're at. It's almost like a weird perceptual thing. Amen. That was Amen. such a beautiful way to conclude that. Let's go, baby. We Bro, did it. Bro, we did it. Two years in the making. We I know. fucking did it. We're, we'll have to cut some of the fat to get it close to an hour, but I think we can get well, it. Well, we'll leave that to Deanna. Big I always, shout, yeah, I always big tell shout her. out, Deanna. Major shout out, yeah. Andrew Cram. Dude. Major shout out Steph Mursky. Yeah. Mike Koziel, Jordan Knight. I'm trying to think of more more mutuals. Oh. Cameron, Cade, aka the Halo Boy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude. Family. Uh, how about this? Uh the quick easy, I'll link it all, but like a good place for everyone to see your work. IG um, website. My Instagram is a great place. Uh it's just Eric J. Rojas. Sick. My website is Eric J. Rojas or yep. Eric Rojas TV. Cool. Or Eric Rojas online. They go all I'll go to the same place. Love that. Um some good domains. There. I have a goofy catchphrase that I say with all my friends whenever we're working together. It's just that it's Rojas, baby. It's Rojas, baby. <laughs> As we were recording, I was like, fuck, I never said it's we Rojas, got, baby. Got, I, you know, it's just it's funny because I don't want to I don't I don't ever want to be perceived as in any way like like i hate arrogance cocky, yeah. cocky but, but like, i think it's like the it's the irony it's more of, it, of a right? goofy yeah it's yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. like it's like i like, it's so cocky I said it to like my stupid. friend miles yeah it's like a cocky stupid thing and then it started to perpetuate and yeah. i was like all right whatever as long as people understand that it's like a fucking joke yeah, like, yeah, yeah i think yeah. i'm a clown like that's like <laughs> it's rojas baby it's like it's everything is ironic and everything is tongue in that's like saying it's showbiz baby exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> so it's like that's rojas baby. you know and it's like if you want to be a director foster a good environment on your sets like yeah. be good to people yeah be friendly make sure your friends are all doing good yeah take care of them and like don't take for granted the fact that like you are able to take advantage of like our current technological climate and like yeah. learn. Well, that end, I mean, I might be putting you on the spot a little bit here so we can edit no, it out if you're not about it. But uh, literally what you just said, it's like, I always say this with the podcast. It's like, you were kind enough to come on and take the time to share your story and share this wisdom because I think that there's some amount of a purpose with all of us and the guests on the show right. to help and to pay, pay it forward. So I even say to to listeners of this show, it's like, dude, if you got something out of of hearing your story, hit these guests up. Yeah, let me like, know. Tap in. Yeah, like you just I'm, found, like, do you know how much easier of an icebreaker it is to say, hey, I spent an hour and 20 minutes listening to your story and I loved that thing you said at 40 minutes. If somebody came up to you and said that, you'd be like, like damn, damn, respect. Like, I'll take the time to talk to you, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. So it's like, that's something where I'm always like, people that listen to this show, I'm like, hit them up. Like, yeah, please. It's a gold mine of resource. Yeah, so, it's like, and that know. applies to other podcasts too. I do that to people that yeah. I hear on podcasts. No, for like, real. Like, po like when podcasts are super influential and, and have been super super influential in like me learning yeah and like me getting inspired and it's like if they yeah, let reach out love it all I'm right like i'm 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 excited to be here and i have to have done this bro it's a fucking honor it's yeah. an honor and i i'm, yeah, I'm honor so glad that Andrew Cram, bro. i'm so glad Let's i got go. to properly learn your story because there was so much more we knew this was going to happen but i'm like we, Holy we, fuck, you know, we also should hang out more yeah, outside of the outside of the where all my friends couch we do yeah it's true thank well, you andrew thank cram you. shout out all the homies see you guys on the internet or irl there it is <laughs>